Welcome back all. We'll continue with the next session of speakers and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker from abroad, Professor Jan Kang. He is a Vice President and General Manager of the Clinical Application Business Unit at NewSoft Medical Systems. And uh, previously he used to be the Dean of the Biomedical and Information Engineering School at Northeastern University, which is the sister school of the TUE in Shenyang in China. And uh, as such, he was a colleague of Bart. Um, he opened many, many doors for Bart in China, without which much of Bart's work there would not have been possible. And as Bart put it, he is eternally grateful to you for this. And he is delighted that you were willing to travel all this way to present here today. Professor Kang. Thank Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, it's uh, really my honor to be here today. It's uh, the, for my friend's retirement uh, ceremony. Uh, actually, the, over the last 10 years, uh, the Bart has spent a lot of effort and a lot of uh, contributions to our school. Uh, actually, to my, uh, uh, to my pleasure, is I know that uh, uh, for today, we, we, our school has uh, over uh, 50 students in Netherlands uh, so over the last, uh, uh, I think, 12 years. Uh, 12 years this uh, school. So, so uh, I would like to, to show some pictures about uh, the part. This is my wife. <laughs> This is in Tsinghua University. <laughs> That's the new dean of our school. Okay, I would like to talk about the cloud arrow, and which is one of the impact by by Bart. Actually, I came back to New Soft uh, after I finished my seven years in inside the school. Uh, uh, two years ago, I decided to move back to the uh, uh, company. Uh, but uh, I don't want to really go to some details about this, so we how to do it. I try to tell the, uh, what we, we are thinking, what we are uh, uh, project uh, the future to our understandings uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, cloud arrow, especially in in China, and uh, the bar will, uh, I think, fully understand that what's happening in China. It's uh, really changing from time to time, and the new technology, how to use it in a, a very creative way. Uh, for me, uh, it's really good. Uh, 
a good for me is I tr a commute between the company and the school, and also the commute from uh, uh, Netherlands and, chi and China. Uh, I also a kind of a international uh, a, a player for the medical uh, uh, medical equipment standard. So, so I'm the IEC uh, 60B the chairman. Uh, uh, and the new soft is uh, kind of uh, one of the uh, player in this uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, and uh, my industrial team is right now is uh, working on uh, on the uh, uh, cloud image uh, uh, platform plus the clinical application software. So this is. Uh, uh, what uh, we understand for this uh, cloud region. In China, there is a lot of uh, changes here. It's just uh, we, we're facing the uh, different situations, uh, uh, including the concept change and the living styles. Especially also the, uh, in China, it's really uh, uh, a aging. Elder uh, time is coming, uh, suddenly uh, come to us. And uh, 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 four elders have uh, 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 one young and one, one baby. So we have to uh, uh, face the serious difficulties. Also, so we, we face the changes between the uh, medical system and the health system merging together. Uh, 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 ten years ago so in China, it's almost no health care system. Only the medicine uh, system, and uh, nowadays we are merging them together. And also, the uh, arti uh, artificial uh, intelligence is a very, hot, uh, a very hot topic, and the central government uh, spend a lot of investment on uh, on this type, uh, 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 this kind of things. So there uh, will be a big chance for all the institutions, all the companies, all the uh, individuals. Uh, so we just experienced the uh, golden, uh, golden 40 years for the uh, medical imaging. So nowadays so we have uh, experienced many uh, changes. Uh, suddenly, uh, especially in China, you know uh, China is uh, a kind of a skip, uh, a, middle, uh, a middle step, uh, uh, one step to the future. So, so uh, when I came back uh, from the U.S. To, to, to China in 2005, so I worked uh, uh, on the first generation, uh, first generation uh, intelligence. I made the software and then uh, enabling our uh, uh, new South CT uh, sell to 114 countries. Uh, uh, the trick is like this. We not only have the equipment, we have the intelligent software. Uh, for example, in the middle of this uh, image, uh, we develop a software instead of for the radiologist, we develop this software for the urologist. So that's enabling we sell our CT scanners to US. I skip this. I think everybody knows this uh, in this room. So, uh, so and uh, here is the uh, in China we have this kind of different levels uh, uh, clinical application software. Right now, the major focus in the level three. But in my opinion, so we still have a long way to go in the level two. So we have uh, many software. Uh, in, in this level, some, something like this kind of uh, technology. Uh, this is uh, organ-oriented uh, software. Uh, this is intelligent assistant. This is a, is a, a virtual uh, a, a colonoscopy. Uh, this is the image-guided surgery. And uh, this is the Q, QCT. QCT. This is uh, we adapted the segmentation method to, to the surgery planning. Uh, and this other uh, software was over the last 10 years, I, uh, my team uh, developed inside a Noisoft group and continue, 
continuously, we want to put those kind of things on the cloud uh, platform. These are the CFDA and the FDA and the CE uh, um, certification. And this matrix is, uh, I, I, it, I did the summary of the technology we accumulated over the last uh, uh, 10 years. And then we put all this te uh, technology in, in the new, new shape. It's the uh, new soft image cloud. Put in there. This is the whole strategy for our new soft cloud strategy. Uh, you will notice in the in the middle. Uh, in the middle, this kind of was, uh, uh, intelligence is for the radiologist because they uh, 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 dealing with the different disease. But this for the a clinical department. So we have the two kind of uh, different intelligent assistant tools. And here we, we want to make more deeper for the clinical department to have the cloud-based application software. Here is our uh, uh, major ideas for the future. And we have the hybrid uh, cloud architecture, as we, uh, which means we have the public cloud and the uh, private cloud. This can be sold as a product. This is, uh, can be sold, uh, uh, used as a services. Here is uh, our uh, uh, cloud product fa family. Here is uh, for the hospital. We have the private uh, cloud, and here is the public cloud. Uh, this is connecting, connecting the uh, individuals. We also move this, uh, uh, move this technology to our uh, mobile uh, terminals, uh, uh, something like this. And also we have uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, supporting with, uh, 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 with uh, any kind of uh, the mob mobile devices. So if you can scan this uh, uh, using your uh, cell phone, you will see uh, the images uh, uh, with uh, uh, cloud packs on your cell phone without uh, install anything. Uh, our cloud is a uh, kind of, uh, to my understanding, it's the set second generation IT technology. Uh, the first generation IT is dealing with the, uh, inside the institutions, and the second generation is uh, do the connectings from the different uh, institutions, which is even more important in China, because in uh, in China, we have uh, a low level, uh, many low level hospitals. Uh, they are scattered in the countryside. Uh, they need uh, senior level uh, uh, experts, but they do not have. And then using our cloud, we can connect them uh, to, uh, to the central hospital. And then uh, they get the immediately uh, uh, assistant help from the central uh, hospital. Uh, uh, then in China also we have the three different level of a hospital. They facing the different uh, different kind of uh, challenges. They have the uh, uh, dealing with the different uh, different difficulties for the disease. Uh, uh, for uh, for our New South, we have a very special uh, 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 special. Uh, uh, things, including the equipment and the uh, uh, platform, also the application software. So uh, we are not uh, uh, like most other companies. Either they have uh, the pure software, either have the uh, hardware. Uh, so we, we, based on this, we have uh, our cloud uh, uh, supporting the uh, specified clinical solutions. We have the uh, platform. We can also have a, a clinical oriented a workflow. By doing this, uh, we are using our cloud to connecting the uh, senior level central hospital to the uh, uh, to the basic level uh, uh, in the countryside. Uh, and then we we also do the screening screening with the add uh, of the AI technology. 
uh, we also have a kind of the mechanisms because our software we can uh, embedded some uh, uh, knowledge and short here. Uh, actually, this guy have a very dedicated measure uh, on the SWI, and then we integrate his measure into our software to uh, uh, to develop the stroke oriented solutions based on the cloud platform. This is, uh, uh, for example, we click one button, then uh, and the software automatically to calculate the bleeding uh, values. Also, we have the uh, evaluation of the growing and also the uh, uh, micro bleeding points by the SWI quantitatively. Uh, and also, we have the uh, analysis for the uh, for the vascular uh, automatically by this by this software, and the only uh, only one button we can extract the uh, the vascular automatically, and also we uh, uh, adding the voice command between the uh, junior level doctors and the uh, uh, senior level doctors. They have uh, informal communications by this way. Uh, we, will, we will also adding some uh, 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 advanced uh, measures to evaluate the speed of the uh, speed of the blood inside the inside the uh, uh, vascular. And uh, uh, in summary, I think we, we, we have this kind of future-oriented uh, 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 technology shape. It's not all of them are new technology, but uh, to, to my opinion, so the, uh, the companies can, using this platform, can uh, carry and all, or supporting your uh, uh, measure. And then we can share the uh, IP. Uh, uh, something like uh, we share the IP, uh, IP with the contributors and then the deliver to the uh, end user. Uh, uh, so this is a kind of uh, open platform. And uh, that's, uh, that's for today. A uh, special thanks uh, uh, and invite uh, uh, Bart continue to join our uh, uh, Chinese uh, ecosystem for the, uh, for the image analysis field. Thank you all. Once again, thank you very much for honoring us with your presence today. And then we move back to a local speaker, Professor Marcel Brewer. He's a principal scientist at Philips Healthcare. More specifically, he's with the business unit Magnetic Resonance. And eight years ago, to this very day, he became a part-time professor in Bart's group. And uh, I'm very pleased to say also today is the day that his professorship is extended for years to come. Marcel, when you're ready. Yeah, thank you, uh, Josien. Um, dear Bart, dear uh, Hetty, uh, colleagues, friends, um, it's a great ple pleasure to, uh, to speak here. You asked me to speak about uh, computational modeling and uh, imaging. And that is, of course, not a coincidence, because actually the first project that uh, we did together in your group, and also with the group of uh, Professor Frans van der Vossen, the cardiovascular biomechanics uh, group, involved a lot of computational modeling and uh, imaging for the uh, assessment of uh, rupture risk of abdominal aortic aneurysms. And I will come back to that uh, later on. Um, now, I do think that uh, most of you will have uh, a notion of what uh, computational modeling is. Still, I would like to give a very short introduction about the what and why, the, the potential benefits in uh, healthcare, uh, the role of medical imaging, and uh, also, of course, mentioning the VPH initiative that is ongoing in uh, Europe. But the main part of this uh, presentation will be a look back. And actually, it goes back much further than uh, the date that I was appointed uh, part-time professor in your group, it already dates uh, back to uh, 2001, because that was our first uh, modeling and, and uh, imaging uh, project. Of course, I cannot uh, discuss all projects, so I will only show a couple of uh, highlights. And then at the end, some words about um, the path, I think the rather long path from uh, research 
to clinical practice and a uh, future outlook into uh, what is often called the, the digital uh, patient. Um, so what is computational modeling? I personally liked the definition of the NIH uh, very much. It says that it's the use of computers to simulate and study the behavior of complex systems using mathematics, physics, or biophysics, and computer science. And it can help to increase understanding of those complex systems to accelerate discovery, develop and test new methods, predict performance or outcome of a system, or even to train to use those uh, complex systems. And I think we all know these, these examples from uh, our current life. No airplane nowadays is designed without uh, computational aerodynamics. No pilot is stepping into a commercial plane without having had uh, extensive training on uh, a flight simulator, a large computational model of an airplane. And of course, we also know uh, all the weather forecast. Uh, I think an example of a uh, computational model with often a uh, moderate success, let's put it like that. Um, going to the domain of healthcare, it's the uh, study of uh, multi-scale, multi-physical models that describe the human body as one complex system or parts of that body, including anatomy, physiology and pathology, using information from multiple Im imaging modalities and other sources. And this can be at the population level, at an individual level, at the organ level or even smaller levels. And there, uh, medical imaging plays an important role. It supplies information about the anatomy of the organs that we want to study, about function, about tissue properties. And um, just to show a couple of examples of the uh, potential benefits of using uh, computational modeling, it can increase our understanding of normal and diseased uh, structure and function. For example, uh, the heart muscle has been studied uh, extensively over the last uh, 20 years, making uh, models for anatomy, biomechanics and electrophysiology. Um, but also it can help to assist the design and the uh, validation of medical devices. And actually, uh, quite recently, an FDA guideline has been issued on, on what to report if you use modeling in device uh, development. Examples are the development of uh, vascular stents and coils to uh, treat stenosis or aneurysms. Um, computation modeling can also help to uh, train clinicians in using complex systems. And nowadays, you can already uh, purchase complex uh, procedure simulators, like uh, simulators of endoscop endoscopic uh, interventions. And it can also, of course, in the end, help to uh, assist diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. For example, the uh, assessment of the risk of a plaque or uh, an aneurysm. Um, about 2000, in the European Union, the VPH, the Virtual Physiological Human Initiative, started. And that is an in initiative that tries to develop the, the digital me, as it is often called, a, a digital representation of, of a patient both for fundamental and for translational uh, research, uh, to in the end provide uh, the citizens with uh, uh, affordable, personalized predictive care. And their modeling and imaging is really playing a, a large role using large collections of, of uh, data. So I would now like to switch to the highlights. And it's a long list, and uh, don't try to read this slide. Uh, it's too long to present uh, today. I will try to say a few words on the ones indicated with the, the green bullets, and maybe in the end also, if I have uh, some time left, the one with the red bullet. And let's start with the project where it all started with, uh, and that's called uh, Hemodin. This was the project where we studied the, uh, the risk of uh, abdominal aortic uh, aneurysm, aneurysm rupture. It was a cooperation between the Erasmus Medical Center, Philips, and the TUI, and also the academic uh, hospital in Maastricht, and the uh, Katharina Hospital here in Eindhoven were involved. Um, uh, an aneurysm, AAA, is a life-threatening dilation of the abdominal aorta, occurring mostly in elderly men, above 55. Um, this is an example of such an aneurysm. It's a huge dilation of the aorta. The aorta normally has a diameter of about 3 centimeters, but such dilations can go up to 8 centimeters. And yeah, if they rupture, in most of the cases, it, it leads to uh, a direct uh, death. Um, Current practice is either open surgery or endovascular uh, stent placement, and currently the decision is primarily based on the diameter. If the diameter is more than 5.5 centimeters or more than 200% of normal, then uh, surgery may be scheduled. But uh, for quite some patients, rupture already occurs uh, for diameters below 
5.5. And there are patients walking around with an aneurysm of 8 centimeters, and it does not rupture. So this criterion was not a very good criterion, and the hypothesis in this project was that we can do better with uh, hemodynamic modeling, modeling of the flow and modeling of the stress and strain in the uh, vessel wall. And for that purpose, we have built up a complete chain from imaging to visualization of the modeling results. It started with uh, 3D CTA and MRI. And then, of course, you have to do anatomical modeling, uh, segmentation of all the relevant structures. Uh, that usually gives you uh, labeling, uh, labeled images or surfaces, so you have to translate it to what is called the volume mesh to do uh, flow and uh, mechanical simulations. And once you have done that, you, of course, also have to visualize the simulated stress or the simulated blood flow in a way that people can understand it. Um, just some examples of the imaging that we developed at that time. It was a combination of MR and CT. We needed MR primarily to look at the blood, even at, to look at the velocity of blood and to look at the structure of the thrombus in the aneurysm. We needed CT to also look at the calcifications because they may play a major role in stress and strain in the uh, vessel wall. And this is just an illustration of how we did our segmentation. We started with uh, vessel tracking, placed a little tube around the tracked vessels, and then inflated until we hit some image features to get the lumen segmentation, and we did that in a very similar way to get the outer wall uh, segmentation. And once you have that, you can translate it into a volume mass and you can do your uh, simulations. We did a very small initial clinical evaluation together with the Katharina Hospital at Maastricht. Uh, 20 patients in each hospital, which were imaged all four times with CTA and MRA. And basically, we studied if there is a relation between the modeling parameters and uh, so the, the stress and strain in the vessel wall and the growth of the aneurysm. And we indeed found such a, a relation, which is a first indication of the potential benefits of this kind of uh, modeling techniques. We also did, discovered that it's quite difficult to look at flow uh, in 3D. So that is why we started a project on 3D flow visualization with PhD Roy van Pelt and coached by Anna Villanova uh, and uh, myself. And uh, at that time, a new MRI technique came up called 4D flow. Instead of only measuring flow in one slice, we could now measure flow in a 3D volume as a function of time, where we had both anatomical and flow images, flow in XYZ. Uh, great advantage over TD, 2D, much more information, much more easy to plan. A bit challenging in terms of the imaging, but I won't speak about that uh, today. Uh, but also challenging in terms of the, the processing, and especially uh, visualization. Uh, there's so, many, so much information in the, in the flow data, so how to properly visualize that, and that was the purpose of that project. On the top left, a rather conventional 2D flow visualization where you have the vessel and you just take slices through the vessel where you measure flow over time and you show that in a graph or color code it. That, so that's the way we do it now. Uh, top right, a uh, let's say rather useless 4D flow visualization, just showing the uh, flow vectors over time where the flow velocity is coded both in color and in the length of the vector. The bottom left, a conventional between brackets, uh, flow, uh, 40 flow visualization, particle tracing. Uh, conventional between brackets because it's still not used uh, a lot in clinical uh, practice. And on the bottom right, all the fantastic uh, illustrative 40 flow visualizations that Roy van Pelt uh, developed. And uh, I've just enlarged one of them just to show how beautiful they, uh, they are. You can see that sort of particles are inserted. The shape of the particles changes with the flow velocity. They go from round to more egg-shaped. Egg you can see little trails such that you can follow them much better. And it really helps. You can see this is an aneurysm, a little aneurysm here in the aorta. This is the upper aorta. This is the heart. You can really very nicely see the flow patterns that are, are generated at that uh, location. So, moving on to the next uh, project I would like to uh, show. This was model-based uh, brain segmentation. This was a cooperation between, uh, between TUE, uh, UMC Utrecht, the group of uh, Max Viergever and uh, Philips, in uh, the uh, uh, IDII uh, Institute. Um, we looked at uh, segmentation of brain structures for various diseases. Within Philips, we were especially uh, interested in uh, Alzheimer's disease. 
uh, which um, usually starts with the accumulation of amyloids in the brain, which then leads to synaptic dysfunction and to a neural injury. And at some time, it also leads to shrinkage, atrophy of brain tissue. And that is, of course, what we can measure with uh, MRI. And together with Philips Research Hamburg, uh, a model-based segmentation technique was developed, sort of a four-stage process, where first the model is roughly placed in the images, then a rigid adaption is done, then each of the structures can be finely adapted, and in the end there is even a, a flexible uh, adaption. And together with uh, Utrecht, we benchmarked this method uh, with respect to other methods. And for the insiders, we found dice coefficients of uh, way above uh, 95% and average errors uh, lower than the uh, MRI voxel resolution. And it turned out to be much faster and, and better reproducible than uh, open source packages like FSL and uh, FreeServer. So stepping to the, the next project, uh, quite a different one, the digital radiation therapy patient, and now we're moving into the domain of radiotherapy planning of uh, cancer, a cooperation between uh, this university, Philips, uh, Dutch Cancer Institute, um, Aarhus uh, University, the Catholic University in Leuven, and a technical university in Athens. And within the TUE, we is again especially focused on uh, visualization. Um, the main purpose of this project was to build a complete digital radiotherapy pipeline uh, with much more uh, tumor tissue specific radiation planning than is currently done in clinical uh, practice but also trying to better avoid damage of uh, normal tissue using MRI only. And uh, the purpose of the project here was especially to visualize all data involved, including its uh, uncertainty. So we primarily focused on these two steps in the chain. Uh, together with Philips, we replaced the CT part that is usually done uh, by a sort of pseudo-CT derived from MR, but I won't speak about that. Uh, within the TU, TU, we primarily focused on this whole chain of imaging, segmentation uh, of the tumor tissue, segmentation of the organs at risk, and then the radiotherapy planning and estimation of the, the chance of success of the treatment of the tumor. And uh, this was done by the uh, always very cheerful uh, PhD student Renata Raidu, uh, and she did a fantastic job. She, for all of these steps, uh, came up with new visualization techniques that also allowed us to look into uh, the, the variation, the uncertainty in the data. Um, very nice uh, project. Um, so, how then do we move all those techniques into uh, clinical practice? And uh, one thing that's always uh, necessary, if you want to introduce a new medical device, you need to have regulatory approval. And that will certainly also uh, be true for uh, modeling port products. And the kind of approval that you need will depend very much on the uh, clinical use. If it is primarily assistance for diagnosis of therapy, then it may not be needed to do a very extensive clinical trial. Uh, for example, at the FDA, you can uh, apply for a so-called 510K, where you have to so show that the device is safe and effective. But if you uh, yeah, involve uh, modeling in computer-based decision-making, you may have to do much more ex extensive clinical trials. But having said that, there are already quite some uh, products on the market, actually, that use uh, some form of uh, modeling. Many products that use uh, anatomical modeling, for uh, segmentation of different structures, either for um, diagnosis or for uh, therapy guidance. Quite recently, uh, co uh, company HeartFlow has introduced a flow modeling project, product that received 510K uh, approval. It's called CTFFR, flow, uh, fractional flow uh, re reserve uh, calculation, uh, to assess the uh, severity of stenosis. Um, but also, for example, uh, electromagnetic field modeling is used to study the uh, uh, heating of the body during imaging uh, with magnetic resonance. And there are already also products that do some form of pharmacokinetical modeling to study the uh, perfusion in organs, either using CT, MR, or uh, ultrasound. But many others are still uh, in the uh, clinical research phase uh, only. Um, and I already mentioned it quite recently, uh, a guideline document was issued by the uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, that uh, describes how to um, properly describe your modeling uh, if it is involved in uh, an application for uh, regulatory approval. So moving to my uh, last slides. Um, 
Nowadays, you cannot go to a medical uh, imaging uh, conference uh, without uh, hitting a lot of papers which uh, use words like big data, uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning. So I thought those terms should certainly be also the, in my presentation. Here they are. But of course, I, d I, d I say it with a purpose. Um, especially deep learning with uh, convolutional neural networks is uh, showing great uh, performance for segmentation of different structures. But the downside of it is that you have to use a lot of training data with reference segmentations. And that can be quite cumbersome or even impossible to obtain. And it's therefore uh, that we started this uh, project that has recently been uh, approved for funding by the uh, UB Mario Curie program. It's called Open Ground Truth Network, Open GTN. And in this project, we will use MRI simulation to create large public uh, image databases uh, with ground, ground truth segmentations, starting from very realistic anatomical models. And yeah, those images can then be used for optimization, validation, and benchmarking of uh, algorithms. It is a uh, project of three PhDs together with uh, Philips Research Hamburg starting the 1st of June. We still have to hire the PhDs, so I hope you allow me to make a bit of advertisement. We are now looking for uh, excellent uh, candidates. Um, and we already actually used that in one of the former uh, projects. This was a cooperation with the Erasmus Medical Center where we simulated uh, carotid plaque. And this shows that we could do that very uh, realistically. So this is a patient image of a carotid with plaque. This is the simulated image, and if you look along these lines, you can see that the uh, intensity patterns are very, very similar. So we think that can have great promise for generating large uh, databases. Okay, I would now like to step to my uh, last slide, and this is maybe a bit large step. This is a slide I found on the internet, and I liked it a lot. Uh, I think it summarizes pretty well my view on the potential future of modeling and uh, imaging. We are now collecting more and more data about the health uh, situation of people, so that's usually indicated with big data, and we have to integrate that whole, something I call integrative healthcare, uh, and that will help us to develop <coughs> the digital patient. We probably need a lot of machine learning to do so, and we have to make those patient models specific, so that's basically the digital me, that already uh, started in 2000 in the VPH community. And hopefully we can also use that to move more into the area of prevention and prediction prognosis. Um, and I think uh, there will be a major role for imaging and modeling in that uh, area. And with that, I would like to conclude. I would thank you very much, Bart, for uh, your excellent support during the years I was in your team and for the very many uh, interesting discussions uh, we have. We are roommates, and I've already heard that nothing's going to change. So I will see you next Thursday, uh, and we just do as nothing has happened. Thank you. Marcel, thank you very much. And then again, I can welcome a guest from abroad, although also a familiar face here. Dr. Marcus van Almsik, uh, he works with Wolfram Research. He's a consultant with Wolfram Research in Germany. And uh, Wolfram being uh, the producer of Mathematica, it's obvious what his connection to Bart is. Um, but moreover, he was also a PhD student of Bart, graduating in 2007. Okay, uh, well first, Bart, thank you for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, secondly, I will not give an ordinary talk, I will not have slides, but I will demonstrate a real live program, so it's always some caveats coming along with that. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, Bart and I uh, have a, a common uh, uh, passion together. Actually, it's my profession now, but uh, it's Bart's passion, and it's a computer language, a computer software program called Mathematica where I have now the privilege to be part of the team developing this software. And um, uh, today, well, this is, by the way, I quickly have to read the title because it's not my title. Bart gave it to me. Uh, Designing Image Analysis Algorithms in Mathematica Today. Um, Mathematica is a program. Today is today, so this is very fresh. And uh, um, I will quickly explain why we give this talk today. Uh, there's... Um, Basically, Bart had a very big imprint on this program, and I'm not sure if he really knows, 
because in 2007, uh, Wolfram Research, the maker of Mathematica, decided to include image processing in, in the program, in the product, because beforehand it was just a computer system to do mathematics. Uh, we did use it here in our group, that basically was part of my assignment in Bart's group, but uh, at that time the company making this product decided to follow suit, and then the uh, uh, director of research and development, Peter Overman, came all the way from Chicago to Eindhoven to basically consult Bart what to do. Because Bart had written a book, which was already on display here, um, Front End Vision and Multiscale Imaging, and that book is written in Mathematica. And for all his uh, impetus, for all his input into Mathematica, he was awarded the Wolfram Innovator Award in uh, 2013. And uh, now I will basically show you why he got this award and what his imprint on the program is. Uh, first of all, why uh, does Bart use Mathematica? I think it's the ease of use. Uh, because you don't really have to know that much uh, about computation or implementing uh, programs anymore. You can almost basically go with the flow. And that has come to an extreme nowadays that you can do what's called free-form input. You don't have to know the language anymore. You just type what you want. For example, apply a gradient filter to the test image with radius 6. You just uh, type that in plain English. And then the program, hopefully, okay, I have to reconnect to the network. The network will, uh, this is, the drawback. Um, okay, I can cheat here, I'll just, uh, uh, no, that's fine. Uh, I think I can do without. Um, then uh, the program will automatically, I'll uh, just skip these three lines and the other ones I've pre-calculated, so it's no big deal. Um, it will automatically convert this into Mathematica code and give you the result. So it will rewrite this into, uh, well, let's stop this, uh, into a command which would look like then like gradient filter of uh, test image with radius 6. And then you do, the next one would have been an image adjust. Image adjust. Oops. And so forth. So you can basically do uh, uh, programming in Mathematica without really knowing what, what's going on. Uh, and that is so easy and practical for teaching that uh, we have done this year at the University in Eindhoven uh, extensively. All the projects that Bart had uh, assigned to his students were for the most part done in Mathematica. And uh, just to show to what extent that works, I'll quickly like to uh, demonstrate here just a few lines of code that I developed uh, just last week was a high school student, Emma Young, uh, in Boston, uh, and uh, she just uh, did, at that age, 13 years of age, uh, do a lung segmentation. So basically she calculated the gradient of the image at a certain scale, uh, knowing about scale space, then did a water segmentation, water shed segmentation. And at the end of the day, after these few lines of code, uh, Oops, you get this result. So that then is the segmentation that even a 13-year-old high school student can do in this uh, program and develop algorithms as you go. So that's one part, I guess, of the bill. And the other thing now, and uh, I'd just like to mention, because most people probably won't uh, anticipate that, is that it also comes with data. So when you have Mathematica, all the data that comes with Wolfram Alpha, our data branch, uh, is available to you, so you can ask in um, plain English, like brain areas associated to emotion. And it will automatically uh, uh, entitle all the uh, areas that can be found, and I can visualize them. In this particular case, I visualize the amygdala in the center of the brain. I can uh, then ask about properties of the amygdala in the brain uh, by just calling up here uh, properties and neural, out, neural, neuronal output, and it will tell you to what areas in the brain it connects to. I can have a connectivity graph of the amygdala, uh, and uh, I can highlight what's active under certain conditions. I can see what connections I have to the prefrontal cortex, where the reasoning is going on. I can look for um, the best pathways, so I can basically associate all the theoretical knowledge that we measure or modulate in Mathematica uh, with, uh, 
with data that's well established. So last but not least here, the flow diagram of the uh, optimal flow from the amygdala to the spinal cord. So having said that, I now quickly relate to the algorithm or implementing algorithms in Mathematica. Uh, this is, to, to pay now a pun on the word today, uh, not today, but yesterday. Uh, when I started in Bart's group, as I said, it was a system for computer algebra. So we uh, did a lot of theoretical work as well in Mathematica. Uh, for example, in this particular case, part of my thesis, together with uh, Remco Deutz, we calculated the propagation kernel of a line. So not what a drunken walker would do, where you get the uh, Gaussian um, uh, kernel as a propagation kernel, but one where you just alter directions, and this is what you get. You just move into a certain direction, and then you may change the direction, and as you walk along, changing direction, you also change location. And this is uh, of somewhat important if you want to calculate or uh, anticipate the uh, uh, trajectories of uh, arteries, of uh, catheters, and so forth, because they usually tend to uh, maintain direction. And uh, then you can calculate theoretically completion field that is like a force field that tells you when to connect line segments and when you don't. And then you can basically calculate and simulate that in Mathematica back then, when it was not really a computer algebra system for doing images. Nowadays, uh, so now it's back to today, unfortunately, most of this is not necessary anymore. As uh, Marcel pointed out, in the time of big data, you can switch off your brain, you just take a big chunk of data, run it through um, a neural network, and the neural network will do the learning for you to a certain degree. So what I have here is a um, neural network that was developed by uh, these people in uh, Japan, Sasaki, uh, Isuka, Simosera, and uh, et al. And uh, they developed here a neural network, oops, that doesn't look good, that um, I can just load into Mathematica, I can build a little command around it that basically sends the data through the network, it just basically encodes the data co co correspondingly up front and then uh, uh, pre presents the data as an image as output. And then what I could do is I can just take one of these images that is corrupted in the sense that the lines are not continuous, but your brain does a very good job in, uh, in this case uh, seeing these circles or uh, triangles or squares as one entity. And then basically this neural network has learned how to do this and automatically does the completion for you without doing all the heavy load of mathematics that we have done before. Now, I don't want to discard what we did before because there's a big advantage what we have. We have parameters. We can tune these things. Parameters in a neural network always have to be learned from scratch, so they're not easily adjustable to different situations. But still, it works a long way in mathematics. You can just put something in, and you can also do more delicate examples where you have here, for example, a technical drawing that may be corrupted due to scanning or whatever, and then send it through the network and you instantly get a good result. So having said that, I think it's pretty clear and as Marcel had pointed out already, neural networks is uh, the game of today and tomorrow in image processing. And so I just thought I'd just give you a very quick uh, run through how such a neural network is being trained in Mathematica. So initially uh, what you have to do is you have to load training data. Now this is a very small training data set. Um, and uh, it con consists of very tiny images uh, that belong to 10 categories, like horses, airplanes, cats, uh, and so forth. And uh, so basically we want to train here a network that can automatically recognize these 10 categories in small images being presented. So what I do here is I create a set of training data. I create a set of uh, test data just to verify if what I learned actually can be applied to new data. And then uh, I have here a union of classes. So these are the classes that I'm look looking for, airplane, automobile, bird, cat, and so forth. And uh, well, as I said, there are 10 of them. And then you just uh, go ahead and create a neural network. Now a neural network, for those of you who don't know these things, are essentially functions that you fit just like doing linear regression, uh, things like that, except, except that it's structured like a brain, like a, neural, a network of neurons, and the parameters of this fitting functions are the connections between the neurons. And uh, essentially, you have not just maybe two or three parameters, but these networks can have millions of parameters, so it's a 
pretty daunting fitting uh, uh, exercise, which is then called uh, uh, well, the learning, basically. And, uh, and in a sense, it's a fitting procedure called backpropagation in this particular case. So I just create here a very simple network that has uh, a few layers of neurons where the image is being sent through. It tries to collect the features, and at the end of the uh, day, it basically associates the activity to the 10 classes to 10 final neurons, in this case, only four depicted, which then say, okay, the probability of finding this particular class is very likely. And uh, when I do this in Mathematica, I would train this network um, on this data set. I have this network, the data set, and then I have to say what function or uh, class of, uh, what uh, loss function I'd like to optimize, because essentially at the end of the day it's all an optimization process. And then I run this, and depending on what kind of hardware I have, it takes 20 minutes, so I'm not going to show it as the talk would be over. Or you run it on a GPU, which would uh, speed it up by a factor of 100. Uh, and uh, then at the end of the day, since it's pre-calculated, you get a network, and uh, then you can just run the network on an image. For example, I have here an image, and you just run it on it, it will tell me, yep, this is a ship or a whole sequence, this is an automobile, a frog. This looks like a bird, but actually it's a plane, so this is a misclassification, a bird and a horse. So you can see you learn something, and this is uh, applicable through uh, everything you can think of, be it uh, recognizing cancer, malignant cells, uh, benign cells, uh, and so forth. And at the end of the day, you want to verify if all your training has been uh, effective, and then at the end of the day, you could, for example, look at a confusion matrix like this that tells you if you have classified correctly or misclassified. All right, so this can be uh, applied to all kinds of things. One uh, problem I remember when I joined Bart's group, uh, group, which was very much a hip at that time, was uh, image retrieval. So basically, when you have a text, you just have a, a word, a keyword that you type in, and then you can find uh, uh, this keyword in a text. If you have an image, and if you have not tagged the images that you have in your database, this becomes a daunting task. So here we have a database, and now we just run a network on this database to create so-called feature vectors. In a way, these are internal states of the network that encode the image. And then when I look for an image, I just take a similar image, what I'm looking for, encode the vector, look for the closest vector uh, in the database, and uh, just like tagging, I can extract then an uh, image that looks like the input image. Um, so here I have such a, basically a big network which we use for what's called image identifying Mathematica. And if I apply now this network, cut it off at a certain layer, it produces a huge feature vector. In this case, a, case, a vector of 1K numbers. Uh, I have a doc here which creates basically a 1K vector. And uh, if I now have a whole data set of these and I encode the whole data set with these feature vectors, I can then create a nearest dog function, and that basically does the following. If I provide a dog, in this case, it's a golden retriever, then I'd like to basically get an image of a golden retriever from my database, and it automatically does so. And this works for any breed you put in there, even for mixes like a doodle here. You can retrieve images very easily. Um, okay, so where is the uh, whole party going? Essentially, okay, this is now, unfortunately, well, I have a backup here. Uh, we have now a collection of networks. You don't have to train networks always from scratch because uh, people have done that before. So we are compiling at Wolfram Research a huge uh, network repository where you can basically call up networks for all kinds of uh, tasks. And uh, I'll just quickly show you one task. Uh, and that is here, for example, network for age estimation. Uh, just import that. I apply it to an image of mine, which turned out to be pretty good because I get a very nice age, uh, age of 44, and I can even calculate now the age probability. And this will essentially go into a function where we have not just find faces, but it will tell you the age of the person, it will tell you the sex of the person, the gender, it will tell you the mood of the person. So you can do all these kind of uh, applications that are built into the software nowadays and that will be part of the next release. Um, another example here, facial features, just for the fun of it, recognizing the nose, the corners of the mouth, the eyes. Um, here, if I take Mona Lisa, it will give me four, five key points. 
and tell me where they are. Actually, well, it missed one eye here, not too good. Or I can play with it. I have here two images, one of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, something is wrong. Um, okay, just, just a minute before I just, it worked. And anyway, you can then uh, um, uh, morph um, from one image to the next and see how the metrics of one person are imposed on the uh, face of another person. Um, okay, you can do this the other way around. I'll just uh, basically title this here Mathematica for tonight. This is uh, what's called Deep Dream. So that's more a game of playing with neural networks because when you have a neural network that basically has to classify an image, what you can also do is, when you dream, essentially you tickle some neurons at an upper level and then send the excitation back to the front of the neural network and it will generate images, pretty much like images as you dream in, in your sleep. And you can do this, the whole code is here in Mathematica. I'll just call up here the result. And then, uh, for example, when you start with an image of a forest, all the associations that you have with the leaves and the tree or the trees themselves will bring up different pictures. And depending on where you do it in the network, you also get different images. So uh, this, in a way, tells you what's being encoded. All right. Uh, so then uh, maybe quickly, how do you implement these things in Mathematica? Well, you can just do a cloud deploy nowadays, which bring, gives you a link. And then you can basically uh, provide this service to the end user on the net. So if you were to have now a smartphone, please feel free to take this QR code. This will bring you to this particular website. And if you go to that website, you will see something. Well, since I don't have uh, internet now, uh, I just can show you what you get. You get a, a web page like this where you can upload an image, and then you can have different image effects like charcoal, embossing, or whatever. And all that is being done basically in this uh, small code here in Mathematica. And you can do that with anything you have in Mathematica as you go. This is the same for a gradient photo. I'll skip that. OK, I'll just now wrap up quickly. Um, and uh, I want to point out that uh, we do still do mathematics. We have a very big function website. Uh, if you have ever questions regarding special functions, uh, feel free to just call up functions.wolfram.com and you will get any kind of uh, variable knowledge that you can possibly want uh, about the people who are associated with certain functions and so forth. And uh, you may not know, but uh, BART hasn't been inactive. There is a BART Tehar Romane function now. Uh, in short, B-T-H-R. It's a very elegant function. It involves a sum up to a certain order. It even has a tensor of rank 3, which is... Uh, empirically uh, 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 determined. Uh, it depends on uh, different particles that calculate P. So you know, we have different uh, entities here. We have dimension, which is two. And uh, we have here an energy parameter, K, that pretty much like uh, nowadays in uh, quantum gravity or qu also quantum mechanics, you have a uh, dynamic uh, that is a complex, driven by a complex vector here by the component e to the power of i k t. And if I were now to import this uh, tensor, uh, the BTHR tensor, I can basically see how that function looks like. Uh, wait a minute, I have to enable. Here we go. And you see it renders a very nice uh, rank 2 matrix of, uh, uh, what is it, 78 times uh, two, time, two dimensions. And I expand it here uh, to a higher, more complicated uh, functions, and you can see it's a quite a complex, quite an impressive function that Bart has here. Um, I can scroll and scroll and scroll, and uh, one nice thing about Mathematica is that you can actually visualize these things. So I take the real part, we want to see the real uh, Bart, not the imaginary one, so I take the real Bart, and I can see that, well, initially he consists of lines, uh, and then essentially he evolves to somebody you can recognize, uh, which happens to be Bart. Well, uh, that basically, basically concludes my talk today, except that I know we are now in for, I think, a, a lunch. So I'd also like to point out that the software will help you pick the right lunch and uh, eat it. Uh, you can use image identify uh, to see what's on your plate. So if I run this, it will automatically tell you this is uh, a potato salad. And then you can go ahead and take this entity value, potato salads are just potatoes, and do the calorie counts on your plate, and that will tell you that with this uh, potato salad, you are bound to take 156 calories. 
And then if you say smart click here in the Netherlands and you're not from the Netherlands, you can also use Mathematica and run it through the word translate and it will tell you, say, tell, well, tell you delicious, delightful or mouth-watering. Thank you very much.